Now, so far, we have covered Linux and we've covered um, the uh, database, MySQL. So we're kind of halfway. In terms of a LAMP server, we've got the, uh, we've got the L and we've got the uh, M, haven't we? We're missing a, an A and a P. Yes? You have to well, remind me what that is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you have to make a second user account in that user account. Yeah, because you're only sharing the Raspberry Pi, so you need one each, won't you, to be able to um, do your work? Yeah, but what group would the second user account be since it's created? It's entirely up to you. I would recommend you create one group and put both users in the same group. Okay. Yeah. Because the, there is pseudo group and there's a new group. Yeah, just create a new group. Just create, just create a new group. Oh, well, I would recommend, when you create a user account, it's automatically given a group. Every user has their own group anyway, so you can play around with those a bit. The important thing with this assignment is I want to make sure everyone gets a fair crack of the, uh, of, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the tasks. And make sure everyone has a go at doing the activities. So the report is individual. Let's make this very clear. There's, no group, there's not a group assignment report. You're working in pairs, but I want individual reports. Now, certain tasks, like installing packages, you're going to look very similar, aren't you? You're going to have very similar stuff in your reports. Yeah? Because there's only certain ways you can install packages. <clears throat> but for certain tasks, like moving your database across to the server, you each have a database, don't you? So you've all got, you've, you can create yourself a, a, a user account each for the Raspberry Pi if you're working in pairs on this. You can move both databases, have two databases on the server. You can create personal home folders. Remember this? Personal home folders you create as part of the... Uh, Actually, I haven't covered that, but you're telling me that's today. Okay, rewind. <clears throat> you know how on the creative server you've got that special folder, slash then the tilde? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to show you how to do that on the Raspberry Pi. So in other words, you'll both have your own personal web space on the Raspberry Pi. So you can, you can, you can move your, your PHP files across, your HTML files across, and test everything out. In fact, we're going to produce something not dissimilar from the uh, creative server by the time we've finished. Now... The session today is all about <coughs> Apache, which is a web server. Now, you've got to be very careful. There's a big difference between <coughs> a physical box web server, you know, the, the box, the Raspberry Pi, the server hardware, and the web server software. Okay, the web server software is the pro software, the program you install to turn a server into a web server. And in our case, we're going to be installing Apache, which is one of the very early web servers. So you're going to install Apache, and by magic, you've now not got a database server, which is what you had this week. You've got a web server, because it has a web server package installed on it. And all the web server package does is it takes people's requests and sends data back. Now, we're going to be using HTTP to communicate with this server. And with HTTP, <coughs> you... <coughs> The user in their web browser sends a request to the server and the request has two important bits of information. The first bit is what resource do they want to look at? So which page, whether it's an HTML page, a CSS page, a PHP page. And the second important information is what is the method? What's the verb? Do we want to get the page to look at it? Do we want to post some data? Do we want to delete some data? Okay, so, the, so HTTP, you have to specify the resource and the method, the verb that goes with it, a noun and a verb. Now, most of the time, when you're navigating browsing web pages, the verb you use by default in the web browser is get. You're getting data from the web server. And what happens is you send a request for a particular resource to the web server, and the web server looks at the resource you're asking for. And the important thing about that resource, it looks at the file extension. If the file extension is CSS or HTML, it simply finds the matching file on the hard drive and then sends it back to the web browser. And that's how you get your page displaying in the web browser. But let's imagine our requested file has a .php extension. It doesn't just send the file back, does it? We register the web server to recognize certain file extensions that mean certain things. So if it finds a .php extension, what it does, it loads, it knows that's a PHP file, and it loads the 
interpreter, the PHP interpreter. And it passes the, the file, not to you, back to the web browser, but to the interpreter. And the interpreter translates it and runs the scripts and generates the, the results, and that gets sent back to the client. Okay? That's, how, that's how it works. So when you configure your Apache web server, you've got to get it working, you've got to get it running. All right, come on in. I mean, that things to say to them. We're having, we're having problems. Um, sorry, excuse me, guys, a minute, just a minute. So I've restarted it twice. Yeah. Resident PC, I've tried auto setup yeah. and zip. Okay. Um, <laughs> Have you got a key to it? I think we switched off. I think it's switched off. <laughs> yeah. We thought we thought of battering down the door using the students as a battering ram, but we uh, we couldn't find any volunteers. Okay, so where was I? Right. Okay, so PHP scripts are treated slightly differently, which means if you don't configure your Apache web server properly, if guys, listen to this, because I guarantee eight people or nine people ask me this question in the lab. If you go to your PHP page and it simply sends the PHP script to the web browser, it means you haven't configured Apache properly so it understands what PHP means. That makes sense. If it sends back all the PHP code and the curly braces and things back to your web browser, it means you haven't configured PHP properly on Apache. You have to tell Apache that .php means it's a script and it, if it finds a PHP file, it's got to send it to a particular place, a particular interpreter to run. And that's been the most common problem with running this particular, doing this particular lab task. So if that happens, all you've got to do is make sure you've configured Apache properly. And I'll show you some of the stuff you need to do to get that working. So the third task is, in theory, is very straightforward, but there's lots of little gotchas. The other thing we're going to talk about is modules. Oh, yes, it's been switched off. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, let's have Windows and Normal go together. OK, so. By default, you haven't got personal home folders, you know, the little tilde things. We have to install a special Apache module. It's like a driver, like a library, to get this functionality to work. So as part of the presentation today, I'm going to explain to you how to install Apache libraries. So we're going to cover quite a bit in this session today. Um, the final session next week is going to be how do, you get my how do I get my files from my computer onto the server okay how did that happen someone hit start and shut down instead of okay I need access to the room now okay so we're going to talk about how we do we get files from our computer on our desktop onto our server now when you work with creative how did you do it what software did you use to transfer files onto the server filezilla which is a type of ftp program it's, it was SFTP, wasn't it? Secure FTP. We're going to set up Secure FTP on your server. So you can, you can use FileZilla to connect to your Raspberry Pi and transfer your files to and from the Raspberry Pi. But we're going to go a step further than FileZilla and FTP. We're going to set up something called SMB. Okay, Simple Message Block, which basically means your Raspberry Pi looks like a Windows server on your network. So you can, you can actually have drive letters pointing to your web root. So you can have your, your, your W drive on your computer at home pointing to the web folder on the, uh, on the server. So in other words, you just open the drive, like your network drive at the university, and just work directly with a network drive. So we're going to cover a lot of things in the next couple of weeks. You, after we finish next week, you're going to have a full two extra weeks to finish off this assignment. And get, and get things wrapped up. So you've got plenty of time to get this, this assignment finished. I want to give you time. Remember last week I said I want you to give you time to fail the first time, to make mistakes, get it right in the end. Really important that you do that. Next year, we're going to um, continue with the Raspberry Pis, and we're going to build cloud computing systems, grid systems, distributed systems. Okay, that's what the current third years are working on at the moment. Instead of having one Raspberry Pi serving your website, they've got, they've got six or eight Raspberry Pis serving the website with a redundant system so that you can unplug a Raspberry Pi and everything still works. And we can, the, the current uh, world record is um, 64 Raspberry Pis in a cluster. We're going to try and go to about 75 or 80 this summer, all working together. And we're going to use something called OpenStack for that. 
which is a special um, full stack development product, development system. Right, I think we're going to be okay. So what I'm going to do is skip through quite a few slides, obviously, because I've covered a lot of the content. Um, if I guess in this one, if we get to a point where you want me to go over something again, please, please tell me, and I will go over it again for you. Um, but this is going to be the capstone project for your year. Everything you've done so far, every development piece of work you've done over the last three or four assignments, you're going to be put in on your server. So you'll have a fully fledged web server running data, running the full LAMP stack on your Raspberry Pi. So let's see if I can uh, get this thing working. Mouse. That's it. It's going to take a few minutes anyway to log in. Right. So <coughs> where have we got to now? So we so we've we've covered the we've covered the basics. Now the last four weeks of term, I need to get you guys ready for the second year the third year even. I need to get you fully prepared, ready for the third year. Now I asked you to start looking at a particular website, didn't I? And start going and start learning some programming. What was the website called? I mentioned it last week. I'll give you a hint. It's a website. I asked you to I should practice Code Academy. Code Academy. Has anyone had a look at Code Academy yet? Yeah? And how do you rate it? It's all right, yeah? Good stuff, yeah? I want you to make sure you work through the stuff on Code Academy before, what, in the next two weeks. Because in two weeks' time, I'm going to take a start off where Code Academy finishes and try and get you really prepared for your third year in 305. Give you a bit of a head start to make sure you don't, um, you don't start falling behind from day one. Okay, I think we're going to be uh, in luck now. No, nope. I think it's been even slower than usual. Super slow. Right, let's see if we can get this presentation up. Uh, the presentation already, should already be on Moodle, by the way. I know it is, because as, as I was making some last minute changes last night, I could see people looking at it. People were starting to go through the slides last night. So I think I had three or four people just, you know, tra I could see which side they were looking at. And I was just trying to finish the get the slides finished before they got to that point. So. Raspberry Pis, useful stuff. Um, next year, huge, you know, huge amount on Raspberry Pis next year. This is probably the slowest computer I've ever come across. No? That white has been so slow. Um, right. Okay, lab time. Um, Anyone struggling with getting the image installed on their Raspberry Pi, getting the image on their SD cards? Is everyone okay? Because I did have a session today and no one came down to get any help, so I kind of assumed everyone was okay with that. My, uh, my Sigma session. Okay, right. No. Here we are, right. <laughs> Yeah, we're good. We've got some. We've got some screens. Some serious screen work going on. Shh. Guys, guys, guys. Now, um, the final thing before the, so we start the slide presentation is uh, the register's gone round. You should everyone sign the register. Everyone, everyone done. Anyone missed it? Okay, brilliant. I'm always puzzled to how it can be so slow to start a web browser. It's not exactly this, the, the, the biggest challenge. Okay, let's see if we can um, get this presentation going. Right. No. Right. We'll like it. Right. Web servers two, three. Here we are. Right. Okay. So. 
Hold on. I'm going to try to hit the button. Okay, I think we're good now. Right. Okay, so, so the idea is for this um, for this third task, you've got to understand how web servers work, and we're going to talk about that in some detail. Build and configure an Apache web server. And Apache is sort of the, the standard web server. We'll talk about different ones next year, but Apache is the, has the majority market share. We'll install and configure Apache modules, and that will give us our, our special home folders on the, on the web. And we're going to touch on SSL, secure socket layers, and virtual hosting. And they're going to be your extension tasks for this task. So I'm not going to go into much detail on them because I want you to figure a lot of it out. So... Open Systems Interconnection, OSI model. Now, if you've done any networking in the past, you'll know about the OSI model. It's a series of layers which allow communication across, across networks. And we're going to focus on three layers that form part of the way Apache, the Apache web server works. The lowest layer is the network layer, and that works on something called the IP, the Internet Protocol. On top of that, we have the transport layer, which is TCP, normally, UDP is more for games, but in fact, TCP and IP go together so much, you often hear it called TCP IP yeah, in the same sentence, in the same, same breath. And on top of that, we run various protocols on the application layer. We're going to look at HTTP today, we'll look at FTP next week, and SSH is another layer, POP for, for, for email, all sit on top in the application layer. So the idea is IP is allows two computers to talk to each other without a direct connection between them. So it bounces data around the system. Um, and for this to work, every computer has to have a unique address that it can be found on, on the internet. And that's where the IP address comes in. Now, we're running out of IP addresses at the moment. Uh, uh, IP4 is the current system with four sets of numbers. Remember, you put those in when you connected to your secure shell? The new version is IPv6, which should give us more addresses than there are people on the planet, which in theory should be enough to keep us going for a few more years. So we're using IPv4. If you look at your you know, IF config, remember that? You sh might spot an IPv6 address on there. It's towards the bottom. Okay, so it's very it looks more complicated. It's, it's alphanumeric, which gives you more scope. Um, IP is a, an optimistic protocol. And that means it kind of assumes the message gets there. There's nothing there, there's, no, there's nothing built in to check to see if it's got there or to see if the message was intact. It's broadcast the message and it expects the message to get there intact. So really it's not a brilliant protocol on its own. We can't really use it. TCP <coughs> is your reliability bit. Make sure the packets do arrive intact. <coughs> so what it, does, it sends data as packets now rather than just streams and what it does it incorporates error correction so every packet has a checksum attached to it which should match up so when the packets get received by the computer it runs the calculation on them compares it to the checksum if it doesn't match it says send me that packet again and it goes back to the server for the packet again and this is where Apache really it comes into its own so the idea is packets can arrive in any order if, so, if uh, 64k packets so if you're streaming a video, some, some video packets might go one way, some might go a different way completely, and eventually they arrive in the wrong order on your computer, and it has to kind of figure out the correct order. Uh, any missing packets are resent, which is why if you're on a slow connection, it's really, really slow, because it's having to constantly resend packets that have been corrupted on the way. So if you're on, say, on your phone and you're on a 2G connection, it seems ridiculously slow that's because it's recently retransmitting packets all the time okay on top of that we have the um, the, the uh, application layer and the HTTP the hypertext transfer protocol is how the World Wide Web works it's the protocol for the World Wide Web and this is how we get the request response system so with HTTP a client sends a request Remember, I talked about this before if we've got the slides and the server sends back a response and the methods define what action takes place. And next year we'll use about six different methods as part of our work. Get, post, put, delete, uh, batch, head, I think they're the ones we use next year. And we'll learn all about, about these. 
So here's an HTTP request. So as you can see, we have a method called get, which means send me the, send me the data. We have the file name, hello.htm, you see that there? Um, the user agent is the browser that's been used to make the request. The host is the server that's, that's been requested from. So it's saying, send me the file www.coventry.ac.uk forward slash hello.htm. That's what it's saying. Uh, use HTTP, use version 1.1, which is the current version, and accept language right. The client is using English. So if there's multiple versions to send, send the English version. Underneath it says, accept encoding. Basically, to save bandwidth, this browser is saying, I can accept zipped content. Just think about that for a minute. I can accept my content in zip form. So in other words, the server may send the data back as a zip file. Your web page may come back as a zip file. And then the client, the browser, can unzip it and display it on the page, and that saves bandwidth. Um, and Connection Keeper Live says, I might be coming back for some more content at some point. So please remember, me, remember this connection. So that's the request. That's the request that's sent from your browser to the server. Okay, now let's look at the server. The web server simply allows data to be transmitted across the internet using TCP IP and the HTTP protocol. That's all it does. And what it does, it listens on a specific IP address. So you know when you, uh, when you, you, uh, you put your IP address in to connect to using Secure Shell? That would be the IP address for your web server. So in your web browser, all you've got to do is put that IP address in the address bar, and it will find any website that's on your Raspberry Pi. And what it does, it receives a request, analyzes it, and does some form of action, which results in something being sent back to the, to the browser. Now, it always listens to an IP address on a specified port. By default, it always listens on port... What's the default port for HTTP? 80, port 80. So you can put the IP address colon 80 if you want to, but you can leave the, 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 the port out because it will just default to port 80. If you do the extension task, however, you're using SSL, using HTTPS, it'll be port 443. Okay, so by default, it works out which port. But you can have your web server on any port, you know, up to about 64,000. Yeah, so you can, you can have a non-standard port if you want to. <coughs> now, the Apache server started development in 1995, which was a year after the World Wide Web was invented. Okay, the original one was called Mosaic, the original web server, and this was called Apache because it was a patched HTTP server. They took Mozilla and patched it and fixed it. Um, it's developed by an open source community, so it's completely open source. Anyone can download it and use it. Um, and it's the most popular and secure web server on the planet. And it runs on any platform. Now, we have to add, right, we have compiled modules. We have compiled modules of code to add additional functionality. So if you want to do authentication, which you will want to do for the extension task, you need to install the correct module to get that to work. If you want to use zip to send files, so if the client accepts zip and you want to send zip files, you have to install the compression algorithm on the, on the Apache. And if you want to do server-side scripting, like PHP, for instance, you've got to make sure the PHP module's installed and configured. So it's a modular system. Installing it is really simple. You have to install Apache 2. That's the latest version. So you can install that package on your Debian server. If you want to use PHP, you've got to install three more packages. The first one is the PHP interpreter. That's the bit that does all the work. The next one is the bit of PHP that talks to MySQL databases. That's the, library, that's the PHP library that talks to the database. The third one is installed in the Apache module. And that means Apache now understands what PHP means and it knows that it needs to send the request to the interpreter. So you need to make sure that those are installed. And as you can see, they're not the biggest applications in the world, are they? They're not kind of up to Microsoft Office standards in terms of file size. 
The whole Apache server is 5 meg. The PHP is actually bigger, more than three times bigger, just for the PHP interpreter, because there's tens of thousands of functions in it. Now, in theory, all you've got to do to test it, once you've installed it, is put, open the web browser and type in your IP address. And it should come up with a default basic page with no style at all. Okay, that's the test. If you've installed things properly, that's, how, that's what you should get. And as you can see, I've had to put the IP address in the web browser because I haven't got a domain name associated with that IP address. So that's how you test it. And at that point, you have a fully functional, <laughs> a fully functional web server. Now, if you ever make changes to the Apache, to the configuration file or to the, uh, to the modules, you've got to restart it. You could restart the entire server, but can you imagine if you had to restart a, a web server every time you made a change? No, it, you, people would get hacked off with it, wouldn't they? So what you can do, you can restart Apache by either service Apache 2 restart or the init D folder, which I think I mentioned last week, didn't I? Yeah, that's the auto, auto load stuff. You can call the Apache 2 module, in the Apache 2 command in there. Now, when you start it, you get an error. It kind of assumes that you have a domain name associated with your Apache server. If you haven't got one, so if you want to suppress that domain name, um, it assumes that you're using 127.0.1.1, which is a loopback address, which is a local host address. It assumes that that's what, exactly what we want. So in the Apache configuration file, just stick it in. Server name 127.0.1.1, and that way you won't get that error message coming up, or that warning. Right. Apache control, that is the command, just like the MySQL allows you access to all the MySQL commands, or MySQL server, Apache control allows you to control the Apache server. Now we're going to touch on this briefly, but this is something you might want to look at and see what, how, how powerful it is. And it allows us to control the Apache daemon. Now, it's worth spending a moment explaining exactly how Apache works. Every time you get a request from a client, it attaches that request to a thread, to a, to a, to a, a, a process on the server. And what it does, it keeps a pool of about 10 of these processes kicking around, waiting for people to connect. And every time someone connects, it grabs one of those processes, assigns it to that person for that request, and then spawns a fresh one to take its place. So the Apache daemons are really important, and that's what makes it so flexible, because every person that connects gets their own process in, in you know, parallel processing. It's also the downfall of it when you scale this massively. When you have tens of thousands of users, trying to spawn these daemons takes so long that it actually can cause the server to fail. But for most uses, the Apache daemon system works really well. There are alternatives we'll talk about next year to how we resolve that. Now, okay, okay, cheers. Now, the Apache server runs under an account. Because remember the users and the groups yeah, you have to have, if it hasn't got the account, it can't do anything. Now, the Apache user is www-data. That's the Apache user. So in other words, if that user, that, that user or that group can't see the files in your web route, you get file not found or permission denied. So you need to check your permissions in your Apache folder to make sure that that user can see the files. Normally, that user should be the owner of that, of that folder. And if you get funny errors like permission, you know, page not found or permission denied, the chances are you've got to tweak those permissions a bit to get the thing to work. Uh, right, the, the, the standard Apache document route is slash var slash www. When you typed in the IP address, you've got the file being served from that folder. So if you want a global website on your, on your, uh, your Raspberry Pi, Stick it in that www folder, and that's what gets served when you put the IP address in. And all that's there at the moment is an index.html file, which is what you saw when we popped up the uh, browser. If you have a problem, there's an error log. Any errors get logged to this file. Now, the best way to look at a log, you could load it into nano, but it could be quite a big file. So Apache, sorry, Linux users have some really cool commands. The best one is tail. Tail always displays the last 10 lines of the file you point it to. So if you've got any problems, the chances are the last 10 lines are going to have all the error messages, aren't they? 
if it's just failed. So you type in tail and then you put that path in and it will just display the last 10 lines of the, lo the error message, the error log. Say you're having to load up nano and try and load the whole file. Now, checking your PHP settings. To check a PHP settings, create a little PHP script, you know, something index.php, whatever you want to call it, and simply put that code inside it. And that tells you all about the PHP installation. If you get it wrong, it'll display the web browser PHP info, like that. If you get it right, you get all the information about the current version of PHP. So you can see I'm on Debian 7, I'm running PHP version 5.4.4, release 14. Uh, it tells me what modules I've got loaded, where the ini file is, configuration file. Um, you can see I've got uh, bzip, compress, uh, HTTP, FTP. These are all registered extensions for it. It tells you everything about it. If you get that page popping up, you know your PHP is working. Um, yeah, pretty much. And the PHP config file is etc. PHP Apache 2 ini file, the, the, the PHP ini file. And that controls your PHP settings. You probably won't touch that one, to be honest. It's not the sort of thing you tend to mess with until, unless things go wrong. Now, Apache modules. Now, I can't spell functionality, but apart from that, we're looking good. Basically, there are a number of modules that are already enabled, including your PHP module, which allows it to understand PHP. If you look in the Apache folder, in a folder called mods-enabled, you'll see a list of all the modules that are enabled for Apache. Okay? Remember, Linux is a file-based system. There's no nasty binaries anywhere. It's all text. <coughs> so you're ready. <coughs> so if I go in there, I can either search the mods-enabled folder, or I can type in Apache control with an M flag for modules, and that will list all my modules that I've got installed. That's worth, worth doing. Now, if I go into that folder and I do a list, how many files are there in there? Look at the total. Zero. Whoa. So I've got a folder with no files in, but when I look at it, I can see, I can see things, can't I? So there's something not quite right going on here. It says I've got no files at all, but I can see five. Look at the right-hand side of each row. That should give you a massive clue as to what you're looking at. What are they? There? Go on. Not logs, they're, they're shortcuts. They were called symbolic links. They are special shortcuts that point to different file files and different folders. So alias.conf points to slash upper level dot dot mods available alias.com. So in other words, there's a folder called mods available, which has all the ones we can use. And all I'm doing, I'm creating a shortcut to all the modules that I want to use. I'm not, I'm not actually copying the files across at all. They're just, they're just shortcuts. And you can see for every module, I've got two files. The first one, or the, well, the conf one, is the config settings for that module. So that's a text file. You can go in there and tweak the module. The second one is the binary, is the, is the compiled module itself. So for every module, I've got the compiled code, and I've also got a nice little config file so I can tweak the settings and get it working. It's, it's, it's kind of nice like that. OK, so there's the shortcuts. I'll put some link in there. Right. Loading config. To install a module, you haven't got to create the shortcut. You use A2N mod, Apache 2 enable mod, enable module. And I just put the module name in there. And it will automatically create the symbolic links to those two files for me in the, uh, in the mods available, or sorry, the mods enabled folder. Uh, so restart Apache, and I've got things working. You need to know this because you, you can't do the fourth task without this information. And this is why we're going to learn about modules. I want every user to have their own personal web space. So in other words, if you're working together on a Raspberry Pi, you can both have logins, you can both FTP files onto the server, and you can both have your personal web spaces, just like we did on Creative. To do that, we, used to, we have to enable the user DIR module. OK? We don't have to enable the config file at all. Now, 
The config for user DIR, remember I said there's a config file for every module. Now, if you look at it, this is where, again, students get it wrong. Everything's fine except there's a special option called include no exec. What do you think that's going to do to mess up your website? No exec. What's it stopping? What's it preventing, do you think? What have we been talking about earlier? No exec or no execute. You won't be able to execute any scripts. So in other words, you will not be able to run your PHP scripts in there. You've got to go into that config file and remove that option and restart Apache. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be whinging in the lab saying, it just says PHP info on my web page. Yeah, it doesn't run the script. That's what's going to catch you out. Right, advanced topics. This is the one used for the extension tasks. There are two advanced topics which I'd like you to have a go at for the extension for this. They are hard. They are tough topics. <laughs> so you know what I'm doing. I think you... The previous group said that, and about half the group tried to attempt them. SSL certificates and virtual hosting. These are, if you're going to be serious into web development, you need to understand these two, uh, these two concepts. SSL. The problem is, you send a request for a page, it's sent as text, plain text, over the internet. Which means anyone who's got a packet sniffing software can intercept that data. So if you type your username and password into, the, into your Amazon account, using HTTP, anyone downstream can read your username and password. That's not good. We don't want that. So what we need to do, we need to encrypt the information before it gets sent to the server. And when it reaches the server, we need to decrypt the data back into the username and password, for instance. To do this, we need a key, a special encryption key that's going to encrypt the data and decrypt it. OK, what's the problem here? One of many problems. Let's imagine uh, you want to talk to Amazon, so Amazon sends you their key so you can encrypt your request. Why is that not a good idea? Yeah, basically, if you've got a key, you can intercept anyone's communication with Amazon, can't you? You can see, you can see anyone's usernames and passwords. What we have to do... Oops, gone too far. Let's go there. Right. Now, to get around this problem, we have to communicate the keys. So let's imagine the other way around. Let's treat it the other way. Let's imagine we've got a key and we send Amazon our key. So Amazon can encrypt our communication. I've got to send that key, haven't I, across the internet. If I haven't got a secure connection to start with, I'm going to be sending that key as plain text across to Amazon. So anyone intercepting it could intercept my, my key and then transmit, translate any encrypted data. So we've got a problem. Obviously, there is a solution because otherwise we wouldn't have e-commerce. So let's have a look at the solution. We use two keys. There are two keys associated with every user using SSL. There is a public key and there is a private key. Now, let's get this the right way around. You encrypt your data using the public key. But you can't decrypt the data with the public key. You have to use the private key to decrypt it. So Amazon can quite happily send you their public key. You can encrypt your username and password using their public key. Only Amazon has the private key. They never release that. In fact, the folder it's in is not web reachable. It can't be seen on the internet. It's hidden in the folder. The owner has read-only permissions on there. No one else can even see it. It's the crown jewels. If, if they lost that private key, they'd be open to attack from anybody. So we encrypt it, and the idea is each person sends their public key. So you will have a public key on your computer, which you send to Amazon. Amazon has a public key on their server, which they send to you. So you can now both encrypt data and pass it to the other person with no risk of it being intercepted and read. There's only one problem with this. Let's imagine... You, get, you, you go to a site which isn't Amazon. 
which is pretending to be Amazon, a spoofing site. You'll happily send your key to them, they'll send the key to you, you'll put your username and password in thinking it's Amazon, and they'll decrypt your username and password. Okay, so we've got a problem here, haven't we? So what we do <coughs> is we register our certificates. We make sure that, so Amazon, for example, registers their public key with a trusted third party. And this trusted third party says this public key is Amazon's public key. And when you update your web browser, it downloads all the public keys for the companies into your, into your web browser. If you don't have a public uh, 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 registered key, you get a little pop-up message. You've seen this, haven't you, before? You've probably seen that when you try to connect certain sites. That means there's no way of telling if that key belongs to that website. Now, when you do your own SSL for your extension task, we're not going to expect to pay 400, 500 pounds to VeriSign. You should have, when you test your Apache, your um, Raspberry Pi, you should see that message pop up on the screen. That's what we expect to see because you're not, you're not paying to have it registered. And this is how it works. So the customer, first request says, hello, let's set up a secure session to the server. So it goes to Amazon and Amazon sends their public key back to your browser. The chances are you probably already got it because it's part of a, a certificate package. And then the client says, okay, here's a special encryption key for our session. And they encrypt it using Amazon's public key. That makes sense. You've sent the public key across, so the, the client now sends an encrypted, uh, encrypted data across using Amazon's public key. So in other words, we've done a handshake. And the bit of data they pass across to Amazon is the client's public key. So now both parties have the correct keys and they can start to talk to each other over, over a secure connection. And all the user sees is that little padlock in the web browser. And that means it's using SSL encryption, public private key encryption, over port 443. If you attempt the extension task, I have one word of warning for you. <coughs> Make sure that the user doesn't accidentally end up using port 80, non-secure. Let's imagine you set up this beautiful SSL, the, the SSL on the server, and then someone connects. Make sure they, they can't connect using port 80. Make sure there's a redirect to the correct port. Otherwise, they could send their password unencrypted. Very, very important. Right, so your challenge is to set up a self-signed SSL certificate and secure web pages on your server. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is virtual hosting. Okay, now virtual hosting is where one Apache server, guys, submit it actually can serve two completely different websites on different IP addresses, for instance. So if you set this up properly, you should be able, you should be able to have two separate IP addresses on your server, or two ports serving two completely different websites off the same Apache server. Okay, now don't worry about that one. References. All that right so lab three is install and configure apache 2 get it working transfer your get jquery transfer your uh, yeah transfer your jquery ui i should say client and test so another thing you did for your for task four you should be able to get that working on the server then transfer your php code and see if you can get that working so you should be able to get everything working your final website working running on the raspberry pi you've already moved your database across haven't you so you should be able to connect your website to the database on the Raspberry Pi and have a completely functional database and website running. And the extension task is the SSL, definitely the SSL, because that's a nice easy task. And have a go at the, for Firebox, have a go at the, um, the uh, virtual hosting, okay? And final slide before we go, is you've been using Debian up to this point. For the real power users though, there's another distribution of Linux. Um, if you, something called Arch Linux. And there's a, there's a distribution available for the Raspberry Pi for this. It's a two gig image, and it's a cool way of looking at the differences between different distributions. It's a lot harder, more challenging, but if you get your head around this, you'll really understand the, how Linux works. So that's a little, uh, little extra to have a play with, but on the separate card. Any questions? We've, despite the town time, I think we've managed to get through the materials. Slight racing, I'm afraid, but... Okay.